Let's go ahead and get started with Francisca. Yes, I'm going to present um, work I do in collaboration with my colleagues Hasim Krishin and Christian Otto here at the Potsdam Institute on the impacts of tropical cyclones. Um, this is part of a larger project um, of trying to quantify individual impact channels of um, biophysical impacts into the economic system, um, trying to improve the economic assessment of damages. Um, and we are building on output from the EasyMIP project, the Intersectoral Impact Model to Comparison project, which consistently quantifies impacts across um, many sectors. In this work here, we focus on tropical cyclones um, because, of course, these are very disruptive um, events with um, very high damages and also high fatalities and suffering. There's a lot of research on this out there already, but it is also inconclusive and particularly regarding the effects of how the damages develop under climate change and also the persistence of the effects of uh, tropical cyclones on the economic system. We are following a bottom-up approach with the goal to derive a damage function for tropical cyclones and I will take you through these steps um, we do to arrive at that, at that goal and to apply the damage function, giving you a brief glimpse on each of the steps in the interest of time. The first step is to derive um, the growth of response to tropical cyclones in the historic time period. We follow literature by Burleman and Wenzel and also Xiang in setting up our economic approach. Important to note is that our predictor are people exposed to tropical cyclones. So we do this by um, using cyclone tracts and then applying a wind field model which is then overlaid um, with population maps um, using different wind, wind speed thresholds, in this case here 64 knots, um, to identify the people exposed to the cyclone. Um, we then um, do, for the historic period from 1970 to 2009, we do our empirical estimate to find the country level response, the country level growth response um, to tropical cyclones. And we find, um, quantitatively important negative results for many of the countries which are exposed to tropical cyclones. Um, we also find that persistence, uh, that, that it is, that the results are very, that the effect, the growth effect, excuse me, is, um, is quite persistent. So that is a, an Im important result of that work as well. Now we want to project these impacts into the future um, under climate change. For that, the first step is to project um, the people exposed into the future. Um, we do that by using the EasyMIP um, modeling setup of um, GCMs, of four GCMs and three RCPs. Um, the wind projections from that um, are used to then model um, future tropical cyclones and um, together with the wind field modeling in an approach outlined in uh, Geiger et al. Um, from 2020, um, we then arrive at projections of tropical cyclones with 100 probabilistic realizations per country. Now the question of adaptation is of course very important and also very unclear as to how much individual countries do adapt to these damages and will adapt in the future. Uh, we try to tackle this uncertainty by including four very simplistic adaptation scenarios uh, quantified through this um, parameter of historical people affected um, the higher this uh, is assumed to be, um, the, more the more adaptation we assume um, to have in the system. And so using, using these projections um, of um, affected people by cyclones in the future and applying that to our economic econometric estimate of the damage, we then can um, have future projections for the impacts. Here is a preliminary result. So this is all work which is currently still in progress or in the stages of being finalized. Um, we find, um, first of all, for the global level, about um, for average um, annual impacts, about a loss of 0.4% in growth. And this is for the conservative adaptation scenario using four legs. Um, we find this is robust across the adaptation scenarios and also if we increase the number of lags, although that does increase the uncertainty, of course. 
Um, but what you can also see in this map here that is that it is very heterogeneous across countries. The response we find uh, strongest damages here in um, Southeast Asia, Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan, for example, are affected most. But the responses are very different. Are very this differentiation is very important. So we find it important to really do this um, on the country level with country specific um, econ econometric um, results as well. Now we would like to translate that into damage functions. Um, our projections for the affected people uh, depend on, GM, on, on change in global mean temperature because, of course, they are um, built upon um, certain RCP um, GCM combinations for which we have the temperature projections as well. And so we can create this link here and we do um, a regression analysis performing about 1,200 uh, independent regressions per country because we have three RCPs and four GCMs and then the 100 tropical cyclone realizations per country. And through that, we find um, the, marginal, um, the marginal impact of temperature on the growth for each country. Um, we use a linear relation with temperature um, because a quadratic relation would um, imply that there is a, an optimum in temperature um, below which we might find positive effects, and um, we don't think that that makes sense to do. And now with this temperature dependent function per country, we then can, um, for different temperature pathways, calculate um, the future GDP projections, taking into account um, the growth effects of tropical cyclones. We apply that in two, um, in, in two ways. Um, first, we calculate the social cost of carbon um, we follow the approach to derive the social cost of carbon on the country level by Ricke et al. In, from 2018, um, meaning we have an emissions pulse, um, which we apply on top of the RCP pathways, and then um, uh, building on the temperature response, um, we can apply our damage function to calculate the impacts of the, of the pathway with the pulse and the pathway without the pulse, um, and then we find the country level social cost of carbon using here a growth adjusted um, discounting scheme. Um, and we find this is uh, quite significant for some countries. Um, what we can also do in this analysis is, of course, we can do a, a deeper uncertainty analysis, looking at the different uncertainties coming from different SSPs or RCPs, or also these different adaptation assumptions. Um, and again, this is um, still work in progress to analyze this in more detail. The second approach is that we want to apply this in integrated assessment modeling um, to see the system response to the damages coming from this one impact channel. For this, we use the Remind model. Um, it's an integrated assessment model, which is soft coupled um, to the Magic C model and also to a damage module. That damage module um, can be used to, I mean, uh, to uh, calculate um, all kinds of damages. So this approach makes it very flexible. Um, to put in different types of damages. And then um, the output of that module is fed back into the system um, through reducing um, the GDP for the growth effect. And also uh, it can elicitate a system response um, through a social cost of carbon. Um, we here include damages only for the US and Japan um, because these are single model regions in our model. All the other countries which are exposed uh, to tropical cyclones and we are also we find large effects in the empirical analysis um, these are all part of larger modeling regions um, and so uh, in this first um, attempt um, they are not included but we hope to do that in the future the results um, indicate uh, to me honestly surprisingly large effects so we find a consumption loss of about 3%. It depends again a little bit on which of these adaptation assumptions we assume, um, with the optimal adaptation um, showing quite a bit lower effects. Um, for the countries affected, of course, there's a quite a considerable consumption loss, and particularly for Japan. And if we then run this in the cost benefit mode, um, so allow a reaction to the damages, um, then we find uh, a global emissions reduction and also. Um, a reduction in the temperature increase by the end of the century by 0.3 degrees approximately. Um, and these effects are larger than I anticipated. And considering 
that this is really only the one impact channel, this shows really how important it is to look into these extreme events as well when um, looking at the overall integrated assessment of impacts. So in summary, um, we are developing this approach to develop bottom-up damage functions um, for different impact channels um, for, for, for economic assessment. We find that these uh, tropical cyclone damages are quite significant and important to be considered. Um, we are in the process of finalizing this analysis, focusing on the uncertainty. Um, something we also need to study more is this wind speed threshold, um, which defines which people are actually exposed, uh, because that makes a difference. If you consider only lar very large, very strong storms or um, also weaker ones. Um, but we also want to expand this work in the future. Importantly, this, um, this driver of affected people allows us to consistently also look at other types of impacts, in particular other, other extreme events like floods, um, to be included in the very same manner, um, which will be very interesting to compare the effects of different impact channels. Um, we also want to look further into the persistence, um, not only from the empirical point of view, where there is already a working paper by Hazem Krishin out there looking more into, um, into the drivers of this persistence, um, but also on, from the modeling point of view to see um, if we apply this actually not as a GDP effect, but as a capital damage, um, can what kind of persistence does the model introduce and what mechanisms are maybe left out, which would explain um, the persistence we find empirically. And then finally, we would also like to look at the distributional effects of tropical cyclones. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have time for you know one or possibly two questions. Um, if anybody in the audience has one, um, feel free to type it into the Q and A. And in the meantime, if um, I wanted to um, ask a clarifying question too about adaptation, and um, and I apologize if I missed it, but what kind of strategies are included in adaptation? Is this, you know, coastal retreat or improved infrastructure? Um, natural solution you it's you know, it's extremely simplistic so we don't actually model specific strategies that would be mm -hmm. nice to do but um but we can't do that uh, okay. with the model it's something we would actually like to try so one thing um we would like to try uh if we can model this as a capital damage directly um mm -hmm. then we would like to look at also reconstruction um and investment into adaptation like yeah, coastal protection yeah. or something, but um, that would be the next step. Here, it's really only that we is that we basically from the uh, driver of uh, people exposed, we just reduce this a little bit, okay. assuming that um, there is a certain level of adaptation, so there's not quite as many people exposed as as in the historic period. So this is extremely simplistic to somehow just get a feeling for uh, what kind of difference that would make. Okay, that's great. We can go on to Amen. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Eamon Mulholland. I work with the European Commission's Joint Research Centre on the Pesetta Project. Um, the Pesetta Project, it'll be discussed in more detail in this same session by Juan Carlos, but to give a, a general overview of it, um, the Pesetta Project's involved with looking at the impact of a variety of different hazards, uh, climate hazards across Europe on a, a large variety of sectors. Uh, but with my presentation, I'm just going to be focusing on, on one specific sector that we look at and a couple of different hazards, and that's the transport sector. So, um, you know, yeah, we have um, and lots and lots and lots of different impacts that affect the transport sector, but I'm just focusing on the three of the main ones that we, uh, that we chose just because of the high level of baseline damages. And that's inland flooding, uh, extreme, dam uh, extreme temperature damages to roads and extreme temperature damages to railways. And the method that we use, it follows the IPCC framework of looking at hazard risk and vulnerability uh, analysis. So the way we do it is that we use the Eurocortex climate database um, and we take the, the gridded climate data in the form of um, temperature and precipitation that comes at 12.5 kilometers squared gridded data. And we take it from a combination of 11 different regional and global climate models over two different RCPs, that's RCP 4.5 and 
and we input this information into a climate impact model. And then we look at the different hazards um, ranging from your baseline, which we consider to be 2010, uh, to a 1.5 degree scenario, 2 degree and 3 degree. So looking at the year of exceedance of a uh, global warming level of, of those levels. Um, so this gives us uh, our hazard maps. And on, on the other side of things, I, I use open street map data to generate our exposure maps. And in this case, exposure maps are very simply just your very highly spatially detailed information about your trans transport infrastructure. So that's covering roads, railways, airports, and seaports. And very simply, we just cover both, uh, just overlay our hazard maps with our exposure maps, carry out our spatial analysis, and then carry out some risk assessment to generate our expected annual damages um, for each of these hazards. So I'm going to fly through each of these different hazards, starting with inland flooding and uh, just give a very quick overview of the methods that we use and then give um, a snapshot of some of the results that we find. So to explain inland flooding, what we do, just taking a, a map of just the rest of London where you have, first we have hazard maps which cover all of Europe. And the hazard maps, they come from a, a hydrological rainfall runoff model, something called the Liz flood model. And that produces gridded uh, inundation maps of 100 meters squared. Um, and it does it for six different return periods, so ranging from a one in 10 year event all the way to a one in 500 year event. And so then on the other side, we've got exposure maps. And in this case, I've just taken the road infrastructure from OpenStreetMap for this area. And then we look at the overlap of those two maps. And so using depth damage functions, we are able to, to convert these damages, looking at the different levels of inundation of your transport infrastructure into graphs that look something like this where for each return period, you have a different a varying level of damage um, and then with a different level of frequency. So that gives us our uh, damage or expected annual damages in the base here. And then when we're forward looking into our future scenarios from 1.5, 2 or 3 degrees of global warming, then what happens is that we see an increase in the frequency of these events. So under a 3 degree scenario, you would expect that a 1 in 10 year event now might happen once every 7 or 8 years. So then we just very simply carry out a, an integration across maps or graphs like this, and then that gives your expected annual damage. So here's just a very quick snapshot of some of the results from this work. Um, the key takeaways are that the total damages from inland flooding on all transportation infrastructure it amounts to about 1.8 billion in the base year. And that uh, we cover all of inland flooding, how it impacts all sectors across Europe and Pesetta. And to give a, a kind of a sense of how great that is, that's about 20% of total inland flooding damages across Europe. Um, the other kind of key takeaway points are that railways are particularly susceptible to inland flooding across Europe. So even though you've got a, they make up a very small percentage of your actual infrastructure, they make up over 50% of damages. So I think uh, railway comes to about 1.2 billion, roads to about 0.6 billion, and then you have uh, very small amounts taken up by, by airports and seaports. And then the last kind of takeaway from that is that it's largely concentrated in Central Europe, in areas like uh, Czech Republic, Germany, Belgium and Luxembourg. They, they feel the brute of the force of inland flooding for transport. Moving on to the next hazard, um, uh, we look at the damage, of, uh, damage to roads as a result of extreme temperatures. And this hazard it can be really easily explained if you have a very, very warm conditions, your road, the asphalt binder within a road, it can start to melt which means that if you have traffic on that road, it can cause rotting, like you can see in the picture here. Um, so the way that we quantify the damages from this hazard, we use something called the performance grade system. So a performance grade is a way of, of describing your operating characteristics um, or the kind of boundary conditions for a road. So what temperatures it can operate under. And so you have two numbers. Um, if you look at the top left of this chart, you've got a performance grade of 52 and minus 16. And really simply that just says that if you have a road with that performance grade, it can operate efficiently with temperatures up to 52 degrees Celsius and as low as minus 16 degrees Celsius. And now ambient air temperature, it's different to your pavement temperature. So generally pavement temperature is going to be hotter than your ambient air temperature. So the way that we quantify this is that we look at the previous 30 years of historical 
climate data to assess what kind of performance grade are all the different roads across Europe. And then we forward look into your 1.5, 2 and 3 degrees levels of global warming and see how often your roads are going to be operating outside of those character of the performance grade. And if your road is going to be operating outside of those, what it was built for, then that means you're going to have a much higher maintenance cost. So then we just compare net present values for a road that was correctly built with the right performance grade versus one that was built using historical data and which might be operating outside of its operating characteristics. And then we compare those net present values to determine what the in increased damage is going to be. Uh, from this, the uh, damages from um, to roads then from this hazard, it comes to about 0.5 billion. So roughly the same from inland flooding. So 0.5 billion in the uh, in a 1.5 degree scenario, and it increases about three folds into a three degree scenario. Um, this spatial spread is a lot wider compared to inland flooding, so it's just a lot more spread out, a lot in more eastern and southern Spain, this or southern Europe this time. Um, and then the roads that are affected are mostly your um, tertiary roads or that have a lower class than that. So again, just the roads that make up a very large percentage of the uh, road infrastructure. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is damages to railways uh, due to extreme temperatures. And this comes in the form of railway buckling, which again, it's a pretty easy one to explain. Uh, since about the 1950s, uh, railways in Europe, they've been built with continuous welded rail. So they can be thought of as just very long pieces of steel. Like all materials, when you have a rise in temperatures, you're going to need to, your material is going to want to expand. So continuous welded rail, it's able to expand to a certain point. <clears throat> but then when it reaches this critical temperature, it spontaneously buckles. And so the way that we quantify this, uh, we, uh, I won't go much into the, the kind of mathematical formulation that we use, but we assume it to be a perfectly elastic beam. And from that, you can determine two different critical temperatures. So looking at the graph on the right and the, the left one, I suppose, which shows the kind of U-shaped graph, it shows those two critical temperatures. The first one is your TB max, and that's the temperature that your railway gets to when it's guaranteed to spontaneously buckle. So your railway is going to get hotter and hotter, and then it reaches this point, TB max, which it's guaranteed to buckle. But below that, you have got TB min, which is a temperature at which there's the possibility of buckling occurring. And that happens if you've got external energy applied to your railway, and that comes in the form of a train going on. So the train uh, imparts energy onto your railway, which gives it a potential for buckling. So what we do is using some assumptions around the railway characteristics across Europe, we generate these TB min and your TB max, and we create probability distributions or probability curves of at a certain temperature, what are the chances of your railway buckling? So that's able to, that allowed us to generate our damages across our baseline and up to a three degree scenario. Um, the, the findings from this was that, uh, we, was that the, the cost or the damages from railway buckling in Europe at present are very low. It's about 0.1 billion, so the lowest of any of the other hazards that I've looked at today. But the, the key takeaway point is that it has the fastest level of increase. So it increases to about 1.2 billion by uh, under a three degree scenario. Um, and as for spatial distribution, it's largely centered around, for now, it's where you would expect where the countries that have a large level of rail, which would be Germany, Austria, and some in uh, southern Spain as well. And it kind of expands across Europe, that increase in, um, in damages. So then just to finish up, I just put all of the different hazards against each other. And you'll notice that the road extreme heat doesn't have a baseline value. And the reason for that is because we require um, historic 30 years of historic data in order to determine a performance grade. So what we're missing is data from 1950 to 1980 to determine what the performance grade was back then in order to create a, a baseline cost. So apart from that, um, the, the key takeaways from this are that inland flooding by far stands at the, one of the largest of, of these three. Um, but the other points are that uh, railways are particularly susceptible both from inland flooding and the increase in uh, damages due to railway buckling. Um, in terms of uh, putting into the context of the cost to European transport infrastructure at the moment, uh, operation and maintenance costs, uh, they would, it's about 3%, the current damages that we've calculated amount for about 3% of operation and maintenance costs. 
and under a three degree scenario that increases about 17%. Um, and then this is only covering uh, a handful of the actual damages to of all the damages to the transport sector. So we're still in the process of the two that we consider to be most vital, which are coastal flooding and of droughts. And I think that's everything. So thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Ian. That was really interesting. Um, there is one question um, from Jen Morris. Uh, for inland flooding, what do you use to inform your dollar estimates of damages? Are they from historical events or something else? Uh, it's based from yeah, based from literature. Um, so, quite simply, we we have a wide variety of of literature that gives us costing or valuation for our different types of infrastructure, um, for lots of different types of roads for the different classes, whether it's primary, uh, a motorway, secondary, tertiary, um, costings per airport with different types of infrastructure for your, if it's a hangar, if it's a runway, uh, same for seaports and for railways. So we have these, uh, these values of um, our infrastructure and then we just apply these depth damage functions, uh, which are fractional so it tells you if you have an inundation, I think if it's above five meters, then it's completely obliterating your, your infrastructure, but then it's a progressive up to that point. So it's just using a combination of your valuation of your assets with these depth damage functions. Thanks. And um, I also have a question. Um, what I was wondering based on the really detailed nature of this work is um, in addition to trying to value the, the total damages under different scenarios, do you think this can inform adaptation decisions um, at these very fine local scales where you know you can inform local decision makers to what costs they might be expecting in the future? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a really good point. Um, it, it, well, the, the, I suppose it in theory, yes, it could, and it is something that we're trying to do, which and I think Juan Carlos will go into the kind of the, the larger scale of the Pesetta projects, which we give adapt adaptation options for um, at the European wide level of inland flooding, especially. Uh, it is quite tricky because we're focusing at the the wide scale of it's, it's European focused. So we look at the impacts of the European scale and it's difficult to be able to, to generate adaptation for something that you're looking at wide scale like this. Because it, like you said, it comes down to um, your local adaptation policies. Uh, so it's something that it is possible to do, but it's not really the focus of this work, I guess. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk with you about the uh, economic incidents of climate impacts in the U.S. And uh, this work is in conjunction with uh, colleagues at MIT, May Yuan, L.D. Blank, John Riley, also some colleagues at EPA, Jeremy Martin H., Marcus Seraphim, and uh, my colleague Jamil Al Salam within the climate economics branch. Um, we're going to talk with you about the, so the, the latter half of Juan Carlos's talk really sort of covered what I'm going to get into, and that's in integrating impacts into a computable general equilibrium, equilibrium economic framework. And we're going to touch on um, some of the, the methods and models we use, as well as um, some extensions to this, this work. So to start off, um, you know, the, there's been a lot of folks that have done this type of work. Um, you know, the first group that did this for the U.S. work was the uh, U.S. Climate Impacts Lab and American Climate Perspectives. We're actually taking the data from the Shang et al. paper that um, uh, MIT has kind of processed, and we're going to uh, put those impacts into a uh, the U.S. Rep CG model. And uh, this is just to note that the, you know, the JRC has been doing this work for a number of years, as, as well as work at the, uh, the OECD. So the objectives of, of this study, it's to really just introduce um, three types of damages into the US rep model. And the, the rationale for doing that is we have a lot of sectoral impacts uh, for climate change, and you want to try to understand, well, what are sort of the, the broader interactions on the economy? And also it provides a nice consistent accounting basis um, for sort of weighing the, uh, the relative effects in, across different sectors. So this work, um, we've done a lot of work to disaggregate U.S. rep from uh, 12 regions to 29 regions. We've also extended out the modeling time frame from 2050 to 2100. And the main impacts that we're looking at, we're focusing on three impacts, labor, agriculture, and heat mortality. And we want to examine sort of the, the magnitude and also the incident of climate change damages within, the, within U.S. rep. So just to give some perspective 
on US rep. It is a, again, a 29 region model and it is a recursive dynamic model. So unlike the work that Juan Carlos showed, we're not taking a sort of a static picture of the economy uh, and then applying uh, climate impacts to that. We're actually uh, looking at what the cumulative impacts of the damages would be over time so that you have effects uh, that are occurring on the capital stock. So that's gonna be captured. Um, and the model that US rep has been mainly designed to look at um, mitigation policy and uh, other, other types of energy policies. And so we're doing a lot of tweaks to it to uh, get it to better represent uh, different climate impacts. And so the three impacts that we're focusing on, again, this comes from uh, Shang et al. We're looking at the impacts of labor productivity. And so there's a, a high risk group and a low risk group. That's sort of the, the top two figures. And then you also have the uh, agricultural impacts. So there's some regions um, that, will benefit from higher temperatures and many, many regions that will, will have a loss of output. And then finally, the pieces we're looking at heat mortality. So the, the impact um, to people because of higher, uh, higher damages uh, due to, um, you know, impact of, of higher, higher heat days, you have mortality loss, particularly with the elderly population. And the results in the, uh, the Shang et al paper, they show some benefit in the northern latitudes. Uh, I would note that the, the CIRA work that EPA has done uh, doesn't show as great of a benefit on the mortality change, so great, greater impacts um, across the board and, and less benefits to, to higher temperatures. And one thing to note is we are actually introducing the mortality impacts into uh, the model. So it's not a post-processing step. Um, we're essentially decrementing the, uh, the labor leisure endowment of the representative agent. Um, so some caveats and limitations. So this initial foray is only looking at the median impacts. We're not looking at the distribution impacts across climate models. That's some, some follow-up work. Um, the adaptation heat mortality is more limited than reported in recent research, so that may inflate it. However, we're also not inflating our value of statistical life, which is around $8 million. Uh, that's kept constant, doesn't rise with GDP, so that would, that would understate uh, possibly some of the mortality losses. And uh, also in the agriculture space, we, the US rep only has a single agricultural sector. So uh, we had to do some work to sort of, you know, add up and aggregate a lot of different agricultural sectors to get aggregate impacts. It would be better to have, you know, crops broken out in livestock, um, but that'll have to be left for some future work. As I'm presenting some of the results, everything is aggregated to the uh, NCA regions. So we have, you know, basically, uh, six or seven regions across the, the CONUS that we're looking at. And, uh, and that's how we're going to be talking about uh, most of the results. Just to give you a flavor of what the shocks look like. So there, there's a lot of regional variability um, in the shock. So for example, you know, mortality loss is much greater in the, uh, the lower states, the southern states. Um, you also see greater agricultural impact in the central part of the country and actually some benefit in the in the northwest. And the labor impact is extremely small, but it actually ends up being uh, one of the biggest damages. So looking at things at just sort of a national level as we you know shock the model, and this is looking at uh, change in consumption and GDP in 2100 for RCP 8.5. And so you can see losses of you know close to three trillion dollars, um, and we're we're looking at this across. Uh, we've kind of stacked up the, the different climate impacts. So we're looking at consumption and also GDP. The um, consumption losses tend to be slightly less than GDP, and the biggest impact is due to the loss in labor. Uh, mortality has less an effect, and agriculture uh, even somewhat less than that. But there's definitely a regional story to be told here, and what you can what you can see is that on the uh, you know for the southern states they are definitely great, more impacted by the labor, so there's a greater greater loss of labor productivity due to the um, decreased work hours that uh, that people have when it gets hot out, and that's sort of an adaptation that you end up working less. But you can also see in the the Great Plains, Northern Great Plains in the Northwest, if you look at the agricultural space, those sectors actually, or those regions actually benefit somewhat from a, a higher higher temperatures. So 
And one takeaway from this work is it's definitely important to to look at different regional variations and to kind of capture that uh, capture that. Another interesting aspect is that um, a lot of the a lot of these effects are roughly are roughly additive. So if you combine the agriculture plus the labor impact, that uh, that tends to um, you know essentially look be the same as if you have shock the model with all the impacts at the same time. Um, we want to do a sensitivity sort of look at the impact of the RCP. So 8.5 8 is considered to be a, a rather high extreme scenario these days. And so if we sort of just look at what an RCP 4.5 would look like, um, the damage are definitely reduced, which is not, not surprising. Um, and that, that's pretty much across the board for all regions and all sectors. So one thing that we also wanted to look at is what are the different sectoral impacts? And how does this, how do different sectors of the economy, are they, are they impacted? And so the main impact, since the, the main channel impact tends to be through the labor effect is that the greatest impacts are in the services, other industries and energy intensive industries because they, those tend to have the, the greatest use of, of labor. So not, not necessarily anything surprising there. When we look at the regional differences, um, then you can actually see where you know the, the southern regions again they're occurred definitely more than the northern regions and in fact you can also see this shows through uh, also where you're getting more agricultural output particularly in the northern great plains um, and so that that suggests that you know again it's important to have look at these things across the different the different regions and uh, and so that's what we've been looking at there the next piece that um, we wanted to look at is how is this impacted on households uh, by welfare and by region? And so what this figure shows is the change in equivalent variation across the different regions uh, for the different impacted sectors, mortality, agriculture, uh, labor, and then all the impacts at once. And so one surprising result, um, like, I mean, for, first of all, as, at a top level, the, um, the labor impacts definitely have the strongest effect and it's greater in the Southern regions. And, it, you know, the change in welfare is roughly from, you know, 2% to 5% welfare losses. And so that's you know, quite, quite substantial and, and much higher than, than what we had thought. Typically you see a more of a mitigating effect. So if you're impacting your GDP by, uh, you know, 2% to 4% or something like that, um, generally your welfare losses would be somewhat less than that, um, at least when you're looking at climate policies. In this case, you're actually seeing slightly elevated uh, damages uh, when we're looking at welfare across the different regions. Um, one aspect that's a little bit counterintuitive is the labor and agricultural damages are not regressive, and so the, the damages are uh, tend to rise with income. And this is likely due to the, the fact that U.S. Rep just has a single labor market. And so when you're when you're shocking the model, um, you know it's assuming that everyone basically is kind of working out of doors or would be impacted um, by the uh, by the decreased labor productivity due to heat stress. And that's not likely to be the case. So I think you know, a potential development and, and further research would be to kind of break out the labor market into um, different different skill groups and occupational groups and tying that back into uh, the income groups. Um, we would note that mortality effects are aggressive. That's not, not surprising. Um, because you're basically just applying the same the same shock to all different income groups. We're not differentiating by uh, by age when we do that, which would be another extension. So looking at some areas to improve our work. Um, so one extension is to introduce damages from reduced form models. Um, there is some work by colleagues at EPA and Industrial Economics uh, that was published in a, a REIT paper in 2020. Uh, Jim Newman was the lead author. And that basically develops reduced form damage functions for 15 CIRA sectors. And uh, also working with Gary Yeo, we were able to look at uncertainty bands across those damages um, for different levels of, of mean warming. And so one extension would be to incorporate these different temperature trajectories into the model and also expand the number of impactors sectors uh, covered. So that's that's one one extension. A the second extension of the work uh, kind of gets down into um, a lot of the work that Sierra has been uh, you know, foundationally we've done a lot of work to develop very detailed sectoral models and 
sectoral process models uh, that would cover, you know, things like air quality, the roads and bridges that Juan Carlos had done in the Poseta project, electricity supply and demand, um, more detailed agricultural work, and then also things like freshwater fishing and wildfires. And uh, the, the advantage of breaking this stuff down is that we're better able to target particular sectors. We're also better able to uh, target mitigation adaptation measures, particularly when it comes to coastal impacts and flooding that we can better handle and track capital stocks, how capital stocks are destroyed, and also the benefits of adaptation measures that we're not quite able to do necessarily when we're talking about some of the reduced form models because we don't have the underlying data um, in terms of how different uh, how different parts of the economy might respond to coastal adaptation. Um, we don't have that in a reduced form model, but we do have that data in some of the, the bottom up work. So, so that's that's another extension, and I guess a you know a third a third piece that uh, I alluded to earlier is looking at different um, climate models and also RCPs, and so um, we're trying to partner with uh, James Rising from uh, I guess it's also done some work with Juan Carlos to look at a an ensemble of the the climate models from the American Climate Perspectives and incorporate that into uh, into US Rep. So that's that's what we've been up to. Um, happy to take questions, and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Jim. Um, we have one question from Steve, and so far um, he said, "Did you apply the ag shock to total factor productivity or output some other way?" He said, "I can see why not applying it to yield makes sense, but can you say why you didn't?" So. So we applied, um, so we did apply it to the, I guess, the total factor of productivity in the ag sector. We tried it a couple different ways. So one, we tried it looking at um, just on land productivity, but then having some conversations with um, the, the folks at the ACP, um, James Rising, they suggested that total factor productivity um, made uh, made more sense. So that's what we went with. But well, we, it's worthwhile to t test a few different, uh, few different ways of going with that. Thanks. Um, I also have a question on the damage functions. I just wasn't clear. Do these depend only on temperature, or are they also including um, population and income? So, the are you talking about the REAP work? Um, the it's just like to right here, yeah. Um, yeah. The reduced. Yeah. Work. So, so those damage functions were developed to be. Um, you could. They're. Yeah, we, we can scale them by population and GDP. So okay. we're taking those into account, yeah. I, I should add that we're also trying to move to a, a temperature-based framework. So a lot of these damage functions were kind of based upon, um, I guess, CIRA 2.0 work, uh, where we're looking at specific um, specific climate models and, and pathways. And so one, uh, one thing that we've been doing there is also developing reduced form models that are functions of temperature. So ideally, we would, we're kind of moving into the space, just as Juan Carlos kind of presented, where you're looking at damages by degree. That's also the type of framework that we would like to move to. So a more static model. No, I, I think we, we I like using dynamic model because that kind of captures the changes in the capital stock over time. Um, but it, it just means that we're not tied to a particular climate model in RCP. We can actually do more. It's just a function of temperature. OK, thanks. Um, and that's perfect timing. So our last two presentations are more on climate models, simple climate models. And first up is Chris. OK, so um, thank you very much for um, for, uh, for for having me. So um, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors. Um, so um, so a lot of different uh, people and um, institutions have been involved in this work. And I'm going to talk about um, the fair, simple climate model. Okay, so um, so the um, the fair model is a, um, it's a re reduced complexity open source um, simple climate model, um, which um, which can be coupled to integrated assessment models. Um, it was um, an earlier version was um, used in the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees as a um, sort of alternative to Magic C. So in the um, the database where there's a, a, a just a, a snapshot on the right, um, you can actually select fair as a um, as a temperature out, output um, for for the models 
um, alongside Magic. So all of the 411 IAM scenario runs um, in the special report were, were also run using FAIR as well as Magic. Um, so currently, um, so, so FAIR is currently um, being included in EASA's um, scenario assessment tool um, for AR6 working group three. Um, it's developed under the um, sort of Einsteinian principle as be as, as the models uh, as simple as possible, but no simpler. So we've really kind of stripped it back and only really included what's absolutely necessary in order to go from um, emissions through to um, concentrations, radiative forcing and climate response. And because of its simplicity, um, it's extremely quick to run. Um, so when it's when it's fully vectorized, we can actually churn out 500 ensemble runs per second um, for version two. Um, so, so the current version 1.6, we generally get about 10 per second. Um, so FAIR really sits, um, so for those of you who've seen uh, multi presentation yesterday, um, it really sits um, kind of between the very simplest models. So the sort of um, metric calculations for greenhouse gases and models like magic, it kind of sits in between um, those two flavors of simple climate models. So, so FAIR2 has been um, paired back to six equations. Um, it can be run with um, emissions driven mode um, going forward. Uh, from the emissions, um, there's a simple representation of the carbon cycle. So this is based on how complex earth system models and carbon cycle models respond to increases in global mean surface temperature and total accumulated uh, carbon emissions. And, and what we find in complex models is that as you increase warming and increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that um, land and ocean carbon sinks become less efficient and you have a greater increase in the airborne fraction. So more um, per kilogram emitted of, of carbon stays in the atmosphere. So you, you end up with this carbon cycle feedback. So FAIR has a very simple and tunable um, relationship that's, that's based on the behavior of more complex models. Um, you can also run it in um, driven by concentrations. So if you wanted to compare, for example, one of the prescribed RCP or SCP, SS, SSP scenarios with Magic C or, uh, or to work out what the carbon budget would be for a particular warming given CO2 concentrations, then you can effectively run it backwards to, to give you the, um, the diagnosed emissions. So from this um, simple carbon cycle, um, so this is this, this, um, this equation at the top. Um, there are other gas cycles such as methane and nitrous oxide and, and methane has this, this lifetime feedback. Um, so as we emit more methane, its atmospheric lifetime gets longer. Um, so this is a sort of well-known fact um, from, uh, from chemistry climate models. We can calculate the atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. And from the concentrations, we move forward into the radiative forcing. Um, so these are um, parameterized equations um, similar to the ones that are used um, from the IPCC working group one. Um, and um, from radiative forcing, we, um, we apply these uh, forcings to a, um, a three, impulse, three box impulse response model of temperature. Um, so the, um, the, the three boxes the impulse response model is a, a sort of an extension over the two box model that was used in earlier versions of FAIR. Um, we find and uh, sort of research has uh, shown from, from Junichi Tatsui and, um, and, and, and others that, that generally three boxes gives a much better um, relationship to um, surface temperature than two boxes does. Um, and the temperature itself, um, as I said before, it feeds back into the carbon cycle and, and cycles for other gases. So um, we have calibrated FAIR to the behavior of um, CMIPS. Um, the first thing that we did was to calibrate the, um, the temperature response. So those um, three impulse response boxes, um, how temperature corresponds to forcing. We did this using um, abrupt four times CO2 
uh, and 1% uh, CO2 experiments from 40 climate models. So this is shown in this figure on the right. Um, the the model um, model results are in, in, in orange for the four times CO2 and blue for the 1% CO2 and the, the fair modeled fits are in the dashed lines overlay those models. So with three parameters, for can tune the responses to complex models um, very well indeed. We do a, sim uh, a similar um, procedure for the carbon cycle. So um, there's an experiment called C4MIP um, where uh, climate models are run just looking at um, how, um, how, how carbon dioxide concentrations of the atmosphere respond to um, just the change in, in, in biogeochemistry and the change in, in, in radiation. So the, the sensitivities to uh, accumulated carbon and temperature, we can tune those parameters based on these 11 model runs. And um, I should also mention that um, as well as greenhouse gases, we have a, a aerosol emissions to forcing module and a tropospheric ozone emissions to forcing module. And for the aerosols, um, we, um, we, we have this um, simple uh, six parameter model where we, um, we uh, tune emissions to the, um, the, the direct and the indirect forcing from 10 models participating in the radiative forcing and aeros aerosol chemistry model into comparison projects. So there's, there's a lot of uh, tuning to complex models going on in the, um, in the, in the calibration of the FAIR model. So when we have um, complete data, we can actually emulate um, the responses to particular CMIP6 models. Um, so there's five models that have done the experiments for both the carbon cycle and the aerosol forcing. So um, we, can, um, we can actually use those uh, historical model ensemble surface temperature changes as a test that the fair calibrations are doing something sensible. Um, so this left figure here shows you the comparison of the um, the fair tunings, which are the solid, the, the thicker lines, and the CBIP six results, which are the um, the thinner lines. Um, the the fair model here is only run with anthropogenic forcing, so we don't include volcanoes, for example, in in this particular run. And you can see that the um, the fair model is doing a good job of matching the CBIP six um, results. On the right, um, we extend this. So we use these five models um, to, we run the um, four SSP projections using a large ensemble of um, parameter tunings based on these five models. And um, so I've overlaid the observed um, global mean surface temperature change in the black dots. And you can see from, the, um, from this sort of naive CMIP6 emulation, um, that the the model is generally projecting warmer temperatures over the towards the end of the historical period um, than the observations, and the reason for this is that our sample size of um, CMIP six models of five only includes uh, what well, mostly includes models that have high climate sensors project um, a high amount of warming. So to um, to address this, we can actually apply a constraint. Um, we can Actually, uh, we can we can sample a large ensemble. So we we have a one million um, a one million member Monte Carlo ensemble here, and based on the CMIP six tunings, we can um, we can vary the climate sensitivity, the radiative forcing, the carbon cycle parameters, and the temperature responses um, within those ranges informed by CMIP six distributions or the IPCC fifth assessment report, and then we can actually um, match projections um, uh, from those um, where the historical temperature actually um, recreates um, the, um, the, the observed historical temperature within um, uncertainty. So this gives the, um, the, the figure on the right. And as you can see, the, um, the, the, the top end of the projection has come down. And if I just flick between uh, the, these two slides, you can see that the effect that the constraining has, um, we kind of lose a lot of the, the high-end scenarios um, from uh, when we constrain based on observations. 
Um, as as Multi mentioned yesterday, um, Fair and Magic C are um, only two of a, 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 a wide a widening group of um, reduced complexity models. Um, and this uh, intercomparison came about because um, it was sort of widely seen in the special report that um, FAIR and MAGIC C um, differed in their uh, temperature response to uh, mitigation scenarios generally by about 0 0.2 degrees for, um, for, the, for, for the more sort of mitigation um, scenarios. And we did some investigation and we, and we found this was mostly due to how the models were set up rather than particularly um, uh, many structural differences between the models. Um, so Magic C, for, for instance, used a more sort of um, uh, AR AR5 working group three setup, whereas where FAIR used a more AR5 working group one plus some recent, uh, some, some recent updates to, um, to, to knowledge. So those distributions of um, aerosol forcing and climate sensitivity were different in FAIR and Magic C. And what we find if we actually run the simple models with a more consistent setup is that the, um, the, the temperature responses are generally um, uh, much more consistent than um, just allowing them to um, produce their own um, assessment. Um, so finally, um, just what I actually plan to do with this. Um, so we are looking to, um, to, to couple FAIR to a, a regional climate emulator. Um, so we're looking to again use CMIP six data to um, downscale these um, these global surface air temperature projections to regional climates, regional extremes, and regional impacts. So the things that um, human and natural ecosystems uh, care about much more than global mean surface temperature. And something that I, I really want to do is um, to actually look at feedbacks between um, the the climate model and um, things like GDP as energy supply and energy demand. And this has been touched upon a couple of times already today. Um, and to really sort of do this um, in a sort of more um, sort of cohesive framework. And if, if, if anybody in um, IAM groups is interested, then uh, I'd, I'd be very pleased to hear from you. Um, so with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, we actually uh, are time to switch to Don's presentation. So if folks have questions for Chris, let's save them for the open discussion. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about some work that I did with my colleagues at Jiggery and PNNL, um, adding a representation of permafrost into the simple carbon climate model Hector. Um, and if you're not familiar with Hector, it's um, the physical Earth system emulator for the model GCAM. So um, in that category of models um, that we were just hearing about from, from Chris. And hold on, there we go. So we, we were interested in adding a representation of permafrost into Hector because we do know that permafrost is this potentially large carbon climate feedback. Um, permafrost stores more than 750 petagrams of carbon in just the top one to three meters of soil. And that is um, equivalent to around a third of the non-permafrost global uh, soil carbon stores. And a recent estimate um, from a 2020 analysis um, found that some 40% of that permafrost may thaw back. Um, so we know that the feedback is, is potentially large, but still uncertain. And permafrost has been represented in a variety of complex land surface models by now. Um, so this is um, a, a study talking about permafrost in joules, another one looking in CCSM4, and it's also in, in a bunch of the CMIP6 models. So we do see it in these more complex models, but of course these models are more limited in the kinds of analyses that we can do with them um, because of their computational complexity. So this is where simple climate models really come in um, because they're able to be run much more quickly. They're a lot more lighter and flexible. Um, so we can um, you know, do things like couple them to integrated assessment models. Um, we can look at um, model sensitivity um, so this was a 2015 study looking at um, that found that the decomposability of deep uh, carbon was particularly important to, to permafrost. Um, 
And we can also use simple models to look at novel processes. So this was a more recent study looking at abrupt thaw with permafrost. Um, and, and then, like I said, the advantage is, of these, another one, is that we can couple them to integrated assessment models. And when it comes to permafrost, what's been done on that so far is been just using the simplest integrated assessment models. So this was one using DICE from 2017. Um, and this is from a study in 2019 using PAGE. But like I said, Hector is the, the physical or system emulator for GCAM, which um, was, a, was a big motivation for us in wanting to get permafrost into Hector so we can start looking at economic impacts um, using GCAM. So we wanted to get this simple representation. Um, and the goal was just something that can reasonably replicate results from more complex models so that we keep Hector's um, light and flexible structure so it can still run really quickly and still be used to, to run large ensembles um, easily and, and couple with GCAM. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about the internals of Hector really um, at all, but um, I will say that, that Hector is not, is not quite as fast as, as FAIR, um, but it is relatively easy to run large ensembles um, and it can be tuned to emulate um, more complex model behavior and, and can run a variety of different scenarios, SSPs and, and RCPs. Um, so what I'm showing here is Hector's carbon cycle without permafrost. And we've got on the left are the land carbon pools. Um, and on the right are the ocean carbon pools. We've got four ocean carbon boxes and three land carbon boxes. Um, and then when we add permafrost in, the way we did that was just adding an extra land carbon pool that basically doesn't do anything except thaw. Um, and it thaws as a function of high latitude temperatures. And when it thaws, we move it into a thawed soil carbon pool. And that can decompose into carbon dioxide emissions or methane emissions. And we've kept it separate from Hector's other soil pool because that soil pool really only decomposes into carbon dioxide emissions. So I'm gonna show some results from what we actually get out of this, this addition um, to Hector. And these are under our default configuration. So we took um, permafrost parameters from the literature that um, seem like sort of the best reasonable values. Um, and we tuned our thaw rate to CMIP results so that we can try to get, you know, as best a, a reasonable representation of permafrost as we, as we can. But of course, it's very easy to update these parameters um, as more and better results come out from, from the literature. So what I'm showing on the left here is permafrost carbon as it thaws from 2000 to 2100. And what we found was that in a, a high mitigation scenario like RCP 2.6, um, only about 70% of the permafrost carbon um, was thawed by 2100 in our model, but closer to half was thawed in, in higher impact scenarios like RCP 8.5. And we can look out over longer time periods. I'm showing these results as dashed here because Hector is not actually calibrated out to 2300, but it's still interesting to look and see what happens over these longer time scales. And like I said, once permafrost carbon thaws, it moves into the thawed carbon pool in Hector. And you can see that it has this peak here because earlier in the century, we've got more inputs from the permafrost carbon that's thawing um, and less is going out to emissions um, as it decomposes. But later as emissions or as uh, the thaw kind of slows, we see more um, emissions going out um, into the atmosphere and that's dominating the signal there. And then as those go into the atmosphere, like I said, they go in, they are emitted as both methane or carbon dioxide. And so we see methane here on the left and you'll notice it follows a similar trajectory to how the, the thawed um, pool looks. And that's really because methane has a much shorter lifetime in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. So that signal doesn't last a lot um, past the um, point of emission. So as soon as the emissions um, are tapering off, the, the signal in the atmosphere is also tapering off. And then with carbon dioxide, we do see that lasting a lot longer because of that longer lifetime, which translates into about a half degree of warming by the end of the century. Um, and most of that is coming from carbon dioxide, but about 25% of that um, is coming from methane. <clears throat> 
And like I said, one of the really important criteria that we had, we wanted to make sure that we're reasonably matching up to the literature. So we looked at a few different um, things here. We looked at the amount of permafrost remaining, permafrost emissions, um, and temperature change, and compared to a lot more studies than just this, I'm just showing a handful here. But we did find that we're within reasonable ranges of, of all of these um, studies that we looked at. So we do feel like the, this um, set of parameters that we're using right now in Hector is, is a reasonable baseline for, for looking at permafrost. And the other thing we looked at uh, is what happens to that permafrost carbon once it's thawed. So we have a certain amount that's thawed, and I'm focusing here on just the labile fraction of that um, thawed permafrost, which is just the permafrost that's available um, for decomposition once it's thawed. And what we find is that um, on the left top here in RCP 4.5, by 2050, we've got over half of the carbon is still in the thawed pool. Um, and then the other 45% has made it into the atmosphere and some of it has been taken up by the ocean and land, but not much at this point. And then by 2100, we have over 75% of the, of the labile thawed permafrost carbon has made it into the atmosphere. And then 20% of that, almost 20% has been taken up by the ocean and another chunk by the land, um, but 49% is still in the atmosphere. And what's interesting is when we look over in RCP 8.5, um, we don't see much change in 2050, but by 2100, and even more extremely so by 2300, we see that the ocean isn't actually taking up as large a percent of the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere anymore. So more is remaining in the atmosphere, um, which is gonna have some significant impacts on climate. And the final thing we did was look at um, the sensitivity of the, the model to these different parameter, um, these key permafrost parameters that we had. So these first two control the thaw rate. Um, the, we also looked at the initial permafrost pool size, the CO2 to methane decomposition ratio, and the, the fraction of um, that carbon that is actually available for decomposition. And far and above, we found that that was the most important parameter, this, this non-labile fraction. Um, when it comes to effects on atmospheric CO2, which are in gray, and temperature, which are in red. Um, of course, the most significant effect on parameter for the effect on methane was um, the, the methane fraction, um, but that's what we would, we would have expected. So to bring it back to our objective, we wanted to develop this representation of permafrost in Hector that can reasonably replicate results from more complex models. And we did in fact find that we fell within the range of previous studies. Um, so we hope that this can be a useful tool for the community to understand um, the potential impacts of this feedback, um, to be able to cheaply explore um, novel processes and uncertainty when it comes to permafrost and importantly, one of our kind of big next steps is coupling this with GCAM so we can look um, in this more sophisticated integrated assessment model um, at the economic impacts of this feedback. And so with that, I would like to acknowledge Christina Shadel, um, who made a lot of valuable uh, contributions to this research um, and thank my co-authors and my funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, do we have any questions that people can put in the Q and A? Um, otherwise, I have what may be a stupid question because we're a little outside my um, area of knowledge here. But um, how come the change in temperature um, is greatest for 4.5 and then 2.6 and then 8.5? Don't understand the physical process underlying that. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, on that slide, we were looking at the difference, it's basically the permafrost signal. So we're looking at the difference between a model run with permafrost and a model run without permafrost. Um, and so it's basically just the impact that permafrost ends up having on temperature change. Um, and so, yeah, it is surprising. Um, and I'm not totally sure of all of the mechanisms that are going on there, but I do know it's consistent with
previous literature findings on the permafrost carbon feedback that it ends up being more significant. The relative impact of this feedback ends up being more significant at um, higher mitigation scenarios, lower temperature scenarios. So, you know, I could I could speculate that maybe there's um, some of the processes are just sort of saturating at higher temperatures. And so the relative impact of permafrost is just not so much in, in uh, scenarios like RCP 8.5. Um, but yeah, it is, it is interesting. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.